Well, hello, everyone. Well, I think we're going to start. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, which isn't many of you, but hello, my name is Chris Fisher. I'm the assistant director here at Burnham Library, and I get to plan all these awesome and exciting programs uh, like this one. I'm so, so excited about this. Um, before we get started, I wanted to, uh, to make an announcement, though, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this program wouldn't be made possible, it wouldn't be possible without the, uh, the Friends of Burnham Library. So many, many thanks to them, and also the contribution from the Connecticut Crossroads Project, uh, which is a local not for profit that preserves community history through casual conversation. So, um, if you like this program, please go onto our website, scroll down to the bottom, sign up for our newsletter, and you can find out more of the awesome programs that we're planning. You can also uh, head on over to Facebook and check out what we're doing there, because we do lots of silly and fun things. Um, but without further ado, last wisps, but last wisps of the old ways. Sorry, tongue twister there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Derek Peter. I'm a folklorist, researcher, and performer. I grew up in West Reading, Connecticut, and live here in Bridgewater now. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about, about two things. The first one is uh, I've published two major collections of archival recordings that center around this young lady here, Camina Turpidillo. Uh, so I'll explain some of her life and my journey into her music and work and family. And then I will also be talking about my hunt for the non-singer, and it's the second uh, part that I hope you guys can sort of help me with. And I will explain what that means in due time. Um, she's going blue in the face. <laughs> oh, wait, because you went to sleep. Oh, that's why. That's, why. that's probably it. Uh, Success. OK, great. I need to just keep moving the mouse here. So um, <clears throat> well, I first heard about Lena Turbeville uh, when I was generally researching Appalachian music. Uh, I've listened to folk music for a long time. Uh, but for the last three or four years, my interest has been in Appalachian uh, folk music from America. Uh, before that, it was a lot of ethnomusicology, Thai, Indonesian, Japanese music that I researched. Uh, but I came back over to America and was uh, listening to a lot of different singers, uh, especially from the North Carolina, Tennessee border. Uh, and Lena was on a compilation uh, put out by the Library of Congress called Anglo-American Ballads. She was on volume two. And uh, I was just doing some immersion listening one day of these compilations, uh, trying to get a sense for singers beyond uh, sort of the ones everyone knew, like the uh, Gene Ritchies or Pete Seegers or whatever. And uh, I was just probably answering emails or scrolling through the internet one day, and she came on and sang the line, we'll stick her little baby full of needles and pins. And I went, what did I just hear? <laughs> so I, I, I you know, replayed the track and gave it a closer listen. And it, she was singing something called Bo Lakens, which is a version of a song called Lambkin, uh, which is an old, old Scottish ballad. Uh, and I had no real uh, background knowledge of these kinds of ballads at that time. I was just really interested in the, uh, the gruesome uh, textual uh, narrative kind of uh, juxtaposed with how, how wonderfully she sang. Uh, so rather than keep describing that unusual song, I will try and pull it up and play it here. Oh, what? Playing from D's MacBook Pro. Oh, great. Oh, Didn't think it would be Oh, wait, it was a very fine maiden as ever they stole. He built a fine castle and a pay he got none. Where is the gentleman? Is he at home? He's gone down there. Oh, 
So the song goes on and she's pleading for her life, this, this woman that he's captured by waking her, by causing her baby to cry. And uh, he doesn't want her money, he doesn't want her daughter, he's just intent on killing her. And then the Lord comes home and because patriarchy and male justice, uh, Bolakins gets hanged as punishment. I have no idea how he gets caught. Um, so there's not a lot of detail in the song, there's just a lot of gratuitous gore. And uh, this was the only published offering by Lena at the time. Uh, the Library of Congress had put this song out in about 1956. And I saw other recordings of her and her family. And the only other one I could find was her and her sister singing a local ballad uh, about a Tennessee man who uh, murders a young woman and burns her body and is at the gallows kind of lamenting. Uh, so I was really uh, confused as to why these sweet little girls were singing these strange songs. <laughs> and uh, I made arrangements to go to the Library of Congress and listen to the rest of uh, the recordings of Lena and her family. Uh, and I can, that's Lena and her family. She's there holding um, her granddaughter, Vera. And then um, I'm not actually clear on all the other names in this photo, so I won't even bother. But uh, that was taken in 1962. Uh, Lena was born in 1905 uh, in Elk Park, North Carolina, which is right on the Tennessee border in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, just going off that one recording that I played you, I played it so you had a sense that she was one of the finest singers I'd ever come across. And there wasn't a whole lot of information on her. Uh, so I sought to go to the Library of Congress. And the worst possible thing happened, which was that we scheduled my visit for March 20th, 2020. <laughs> so uh, everything closed. Uh, I was not able to get to the library. Their digitiza digitization services shut down. Uh, I had intended to get all of the uh, recordings of her and her family digitized. They were made by a man uh, in the funny hat there. Uh, Herbert Halpert, who is sort of, if anyone knows Alan Lomax, has heard the name Alan Lomax? So Halpert was a similar folklorist. He went around uh, in the pre-war period and to the south and uh, did some work with, uh, her name's escaping, Zora Neale Hurston, recorded some songs that she knew. So uh, he was a pretty significant folklorist, but people mostly remember Alan Lomax. Uh, one of my goals in my work is to change that and get people to know Halpert's name. Uh, so Halpert went down to the American South as part of the WPA and uh, was granted, uh, actually this is a, um, an old ambulance that they bothered to paint streetcar black to send him down to the south, and they uh, retrofitted all the cabinets in the ambulance with uh, space for his notebooks and recording equipments, uh, and so he went down to document Nina and her family, uh, and like I say, all of those recordings were made to either acetate or aluminum discs, which is how they did it back in the 30s, and uh, a lot of them were not digitized, and I wanted them digitized and COVID pretty much said no for a long time. Uh, so uh, one of the things I wanna mention about uh, his particular folklore journey, uh, Halpert's, is that when he went down to uh, Virginia and North Carolina and Tennessee, uh, he would often run out of recording discs and have to sit and play harmonica and eat supper with the families and write Washington for more discs. And when he came home, uh, the WPA ended about a month after he got back to New York, and he hung his head and he was like, I'm sorry I didn't get more done. You know, I really wanted to, but I, you, got, you had to keep mailing me these, you know, it took time. And they were like, are you kidding? You, you made like hundreds, you made way more than we thought you were going to. So he, he took hundreds of valuable recordings from the American South uh, in 1939, uh, just before the war. Uh, Lena was recorded in April of 39, so uh, pretty lucky that he was able to go down there before. Uh, everything sort of broke loose, and uh, hoping things don't break loose again and I get to keep doing this this summer, but that's another story. So COVID halted my digitization hopes. Um, so I was left with these two unusual songs, sung very well by these young girls, and uh, it, what I ended up doing was just sort of reaching into the internet and trying to figure out what I could find uh, about Lena and her family, and the only other little fragment I could obtain was uh, she sang just a piece of the bald-headed end of the broom, uh, which is an old kind of country song I sang about hee So it was slightly more uh, jovial and less bloody. Um, so, uh, but, it, but she was still kind of a mystery. So what I ended up having to do uh, was, was sort of try and get in touch with anyone who might still be alive in her family. Uh, and so I called her grandson, Carlos, and I very feebly asked him if he was the grandson of Lena Turbyville, and he said he was. Uh, and so we had quite a conversation uh, and uh, this culminated in me getting in touch with a lot of her family, and she's got a huge family. Uh, and uh, the, the real prize in getting to know them was that they introduced me to Lena's last living daughter, Nikki, uh, Nicola Pritchard, who was born Nikki Turbyville. And uh, I went down 
to the South uh, first time in 2021, in July, and there I am with Nikki. <laughs> and um, we were talking about, you know, all the Appalachian traditions that, that her family kind of grew up doing. And uh, Nikki was born in 1934, uh, so she was about five years old when Halpert came to visit. And she can remember because they had no electricity in the house that there were wires uh, hooked up to the doorknob. They had an iron doorknob in the kitchen and she just remembers oh piles God. of wires everywhere. Um, Halpert often would have to take his subjects to a hotel because they, the generator wouldn't work in people's homes for very long or it would be too noisy. Uh, and he remembers saying that even though he had to bring these you know, little old men and ladies to hotels and get them to sing these old songs and put them in such an uncomfortable position, they often sang and sang well uh, and I often think if someone shuttled me into a hotel in Danbury and told me to say what I knew, I, I'd probably be like, are you, you going to pay me to do that? You know, but he had, he had great success. Um, so, so Nikki grew up most of her life without a radio, and I think that's really significant because a lot of the songs that were learned you know, back then were orally transmitted, and then the radio kind of messed everything up. You had like, you know, the uh, Elvises and the uh, Bing Crosby's, you know, and we were close to my team being really kind of soulful. And it just changed the way people sang. Mm -hmm. And I think it changed the way people thought about singing. Uh, but this family had certainly had a, a, a firm Appalachian tradition. Um, and Nikki can remember wild crafting, which is uh, where you go harvest herbs, you know, like uh, black cohosh for menopause and, uh, you know, wild ginseng and things like this. Um, but she couldn't remember a lot of the songs. Uh, she was not in great health when I met her. Uh, she had some carcinoid tumors in her lungs and uh, other things, and uh, had had some surgeries that she thinks affected her memory. Uh, and so she didn't remember a lot of the music on our first encounter, but she did remember Bo Lakins, and she consented to sing it for me. Mm -hmm. Bo Lakins was a baker found mason as ever laid stone. He built a fine castle and they got none. Where is the gentleman if he at home? He's gone to marry visit his son. Where is the lady? Is she at home? She's upstairs sleeping, said the foster to him. How will we get her down such a dark night as this? We'll stick the little baby to an eagle's and hands. And she told me that's the only song she remembered because how could you forget something like that? Yeah. And she'd say, Mama, did they really stick that baby full of needles and pins? And Lena you know, would tell her, no, it's just an old story. There's nothing to worry about. But um, a lot of scholars argue that that ballad has basis in fact, but that's another story. Um, I brought up the, the idea of a non-singer earlier, and what I mean by that is I, uh, in my work, uh, since I've met this family, I've been really interested in finding examples of people who have musical memory in their family, but don't consider themselves singers. You know, oh, my grandfather always used to sing this, but I won't sing it, I'm not very good. Those are the people that I want to sing for me. Um, so as I got to know Nikki a little bit more, uh, we had a lot of phone calls, you know, I, I only visited her uh, once, she didn't live eight months after I met her, mm -hmm. so I'm glad I was able to uh, extract these memories, but we had a lot of phone calls, uh, and so uh, this is another example of her being what I think of as a non-singer. The one that I heard was the one that takes them in the breeze. Mostly, they sang about the like the Tom Goodley, you know, they made yeah, oh, sure. the, So in other words, you got it from the movies, or you knew it before that? Oh yeah, I heard it before that. And how does it go? Do you remember? You know, see, uh, it said, Frankie and Johnny were sweethearts. Boy, how they did love. Both swore to be true to each other, to the stars above. He was her man. She was doing him wrong. Johnny 
So she did sing and she sang well, but I still think of her as a non-singer because these were just sort of memories she held on to. Uh, I, I preserved and, and released that phone call because if you notice at the beginning of the recording, she makes the very important distinction that they sang it in the movies, but I said, do you remember it before that? And she said, yes. Mm -hmm. And so actually our, our town star Mia Farrow sang Frankie and Johnny in that uh, uh, Death on the Nile, I think. So, you know, it, it did get around uh, with the advent of modern media, but what was important to me is that she knew it before that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of been my aim in trying to uh, preserve and record some of these folks. And uh, you know, here's Nikki taking my field recorder like a walkie-talkie and singing mm -hmm. into it. I've never had that experience. Usually people don't even want to look at it when they're giving me their memories, but she, she just wanted to pick it up and talk into it. She was pretty fantastic. Um, so so in, in getting to know her for the eight months that I did, and, and not just the music, but the, the stories and the experiences that she could share of just this way of life that was sort of unsullied by uh, modern progress, uh, it became pretty clear to me that uh, sitting in living rooms all over America, there were you know little old ladies with amazing things to tell me. So uh, that's really become a, a big part of my work with this stuff. I've, I've been pretty successful in meeting uh, lay people that, that you wouldn't think of as singers, but have nonetheless shared some pretty significant memories with me. Uh, and and I've also been um, is that the next slide? Yeah, yeah I guess it is. Uh, I've also been sort of following in the footsteps of uh, Helen Hartman's Flanders, uh, who's who's here uh, interviewing. Uh, a non-singer, uh, Ellen Burdett. Uh, don't know too much about her, but uh, Mrs. Flanders operated out of uh, Middlebury College in Vermont, and she took a lot of recordings in New England. Uh, the thing I find really funny is, she, though she took thousands of recordings in Vermont and Maine and New Hampshire, she only took about like six dozen from Connecticut. <laughs> so I feel like there's somehow a dearth of, uh, of documented music in this state, and I'm confused. Um, when I went to the Library of Congress finally in January, uh, they said, don't bother with the card catalog, we have it all online. And of course I went over and bothered with the card catalog because it's way more fun. Uh, and uh, they had a bunch of things or organized by year, pre-war and post-war, but they also had a, a, a stack of uh, cabinets that were by location. And Canada obviously had several, and Colorado had a few. And then you had the Connecticut card, and then it was on to the next state, and, and I was like, oh. So there's not a lot in Connecticut uh, as far as, as what's been documented uh, so far. Uh, so I'm really hoping to turn that tide. Um, I've had a little bit of success so far in looking for, for these non-singers, people that remember songs, but uh, I think it's important that the Connecticut Crossroads Project is with me on this because uh, their mission is certainly to uh, record the stories and memories of people through casual conversation, as Chris said, but uh, I would also be interested in the songs. So uh, if anyone has memories of this stuff or knows of someone who might, um, I can give you my contact at the end of this and, and we can talk about that. Um, but anyway, uh, having met uh, Lena's daughter and uh, uh, finally receiving the recordings of Lena from the Library of Congress, uh, I wanted to publish them uh, in some way. So uh, I've put uh, two records out so far, uh, Last Wisps of the Old Ways and Ever Since We've Known It. Um, the first one has a few recordings I myself took of Nikki and some other people, uh, but mostly dealt with the 1939 recordings that Herbert Halpert made. And the second one, ever since we known it, I tried to put the focus more on Lena. Uh, it's all archival recordings. There were none there that I made. Uh, and uh, I really just felt like she was not given her due for whatever reason. Uh, I think a lot of singers that were re recorded in that time period, there were just so many of them that I think people fell through the cracks. So I'm trying to give her a second wind. Uh, and it's gone really well. Uh, she's gotten a lot of attention. She's, she's gotten, I've made music for 10 years and I've, I've pushed really hard to be on radio and stuff and she's gotten further than I have in certain places because I think uh, people just love Lena and so my hunch was correct. So i um, play you a little bit more of her. Uh, you don't want to listen to me, you want to listen to her. Yeah. Uh, what's her name? Lily. Oh, okay. Get along home, send me, send me, get along home, send me, send me, get along home, send me, 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 Get along home, send me, send me, get along home, send me, send me, get along home. 
sense of the space that these people were singing in. Uh, so he obviously pulled Ben over uh, from wherever he was to get him to sing the last few verses of that. Uh, so there's not a lot there musically, but there's a lot there situationally for some of these. Uh, so I didn't just want complete performances, I wanted these kind of stories. Um, I often think of these songs as the headlines and then the people's uh, situations as the uh, articles. And you want to read the article, not the headline. Um, I, I think one more from these compilations to sort of show you, which is uh, Lena's older sister, uh, I've just never heard partridge in a pear tree quite like this. Is there anything your family used to sing? 
when it was my uncle up at the farm. We didn't know when I was like two or three years old, I was always up at the farm, mm. and I used to sit and when he did an old horse and tractor. Uh, they had wide flat hook out and I used to sit on that and ride round with him all, mm. all wherever I could or <laughs> whenever I could. And he had a, and it, uh, it just a little bit, and it is a little bit of a song, and he called it a prickety bush. Do you remember that one then? Yeah, so, well, what bit I remember it isn't like, because of some of it I just had to laugh. Oh, the prickety bush. Or silver to set me free. La 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 la. And it's all for the prickety bush. Oh, the prickety bush. So that, was, that little fragment was worth more to me than these like dazzling poems and harmonies that he was doing with his wife. Uh, so his accent's sort of hard to understand. Uh, but when he was like two or three, his uncle would ride him around on the tractor on his knee. Uh, and sing that song to him over and over. And uh, that's about as old as Bill Lakin's. Uh, they're both like three, four, five, six, seven. Hun no one knows. Hundred year old Scotch ballads that came over uh, from Scotland. Uh, Lampkin is about a mason who didn't get paid. There was a lot of masonry in Scotland at the time. Uh, I would guess that that song is from the 12th century. Uh, the Prickety Bush is a version of this song called Hangman, uh, which was covered by Led Zeppelin. Um, hangman hold the rope a while. I think I've seen my father coming. Uh, so it's it's gotten around, but it's a very one of the oldest ballads. So hearing that come out of Will's mouth, knowing that his uncle sang it to him, knowing that his uncle probably learned that from his father or grandfather, and that it had been in the family for at least two or three hundred years, that was worth more to me than them learning like this Victorian poem and doing harmonies for me. So um, I'm really picky. Uh, I'm, I'm really after these, these really old memories, and I feel like the thing about them that's so unusual is uh, they're the thing that people will, will kind of give to me with the most reluctance because they don't feel like it's a complete picture. Um, but I find that if you can have the conversation about when and where they were uh, recorded, uh, uh, sorry, when and where they were learned, and, and you can record and document that moment, that tells more of a story than someone learning something off a song sheet or YouTube video. Uh, so that's been the, the focus of my work. Uh, I've tried to do some of this in Connecticut recently. I was uh, up in West Cornwall this week. I met with a fiddle player and her husband and they had a few, like, you know, her grandmother used to sing like, pony girl, pony girl, riding fast, riding slow. Uh, but there wasn't anything in the way of ballads or anything, but it was, you know, a nice song memory to have. Uh, the only other interesting thing that's happened to me uh, and I regret I can't play the recording because she was so ashamed that she even sang this for me that she just said, don't do anything with it. Um, when I got to the Library of Congress in January, uh, I had been researching another uh, New England folklorist called Phillips Berry, uh, and he mostly operated in Maine, so there was, again, not a lot of Connecticut stuff, uh, but he'd made some old cylinder recordings. Uh, so before acetate and shellac and aluminum discs, People used to have to make recordings on these wax cylinders that look like soup cans. Uh, and they usually don't stay terribly well preserved because it's wax. So a lot of these recordings are like, you know, it's like pretty squished. Uh, but his was in pretty good shape uh, for this one gentleman called uh, Adam Morris from Kingman, Maine. Uh, he must have come down from Prince Edward Island, was sort of the Penobscot Bay region. And uh, there were a few recordings in there that I was interested in working with for a project that I'm working on. Uh, and the Library of Congress was pretty vague on who owned the uh, Barry collection, uh, but they said a surefire way if you want to release these recordings is to go through the family, which is obviously something I'm comfortable doing at this point is reaching out to these people's families. Well, his, his granddaughter lives in Bristol, so we went to Panera Bread. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she also remembered him singing a song called Froggy When According, uh, taking uh, her on his knee and singing that. And that song was first published in 15... 62 or 3. Uh, so the fact that he remembered that and it might have been in the family for 500 years was, was I regret I can't play you singing that for me in Panera Bread, but she said no. Um, so, uh, so this is sort of what I've been looking for and that's where the title Last Wisps of the Old Ways sort of comes from. I'm looking for these sort of last vestiges of, of uh, hundreds of years of tradition and uh, there, was a, there was sort of a predominant opinion on uh, Field recording in the 80s that you couldn't do it anymore. There was uh, a documentary, you can look it up, it's on PBS, uh, 
if you go to PBS Pass It On, Helen Flanders should come up. It's like a 20 minute free to watch online thing. Uh, and even those librarians in the 80s were like, no one is around to tell these stories anymore. You know, we just have to work with what's been preserved. And uh, I'm here to say that's false. <laughs> so, uh, so a lot of my work has been uh, in, in very carefully trying to find these, these informants. And uh, so uh, I want to just play two, two final recordings and then I'd like to uh, open up for questions because I'm interested in what anyone might be able to tell me. Uh, the first is of Lena singing an old song called Paper of Pins. Uh, and then uh, one of Helen Flanders' only Connecticut informants was called Oscar de Grigna, and he lived in West Cornwall, uh, and he sang the same song. So just to do a little bit of comparison listening of the Southern Appalachian version versus the Connecticut version. Well, what makes this song? Paper pen. Dear Mama, buy you paper or pen. That is the way our love begins. If you will marry me, if you Shepley. 
People say Shipley. No, it was Shepley in West Yorkshire, which is a yeah. little farm town in West Yorkshire. Yeah. Uh, I met him a couple of times. You've met Will? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, great. And here he is looking out over the home valley, um, pointing out everything to me. Just about I live everything. in South Kent now, but for 30 years to the day, I lived in Bedford, in Katona. Ah. And when I met him the first time, he said that he'd been to America. And I said, where was that? Where did you go? And he said, because he, he was a dry stone wall builder. He yes. said dry stone wall. He showed me the, the do's and don'ts of dry stone walling, by the way. It was really interesting. But he said, I don't know whether you've ever heard of it. It's a place called uh, Mount Kisco, <laughs> <laughs> which is, of course, continuous to uh, Bedford. Right. Indeed, I did. And I said, well, where was the stone wall? And it was on Gord Hill Road. And he, uh, been hired by somebody. I didn't know who had hired him, but there were a lot of high rollers that had come into town. And they brought Will and a whole team over from Yorkshire. Yeah. And they were there for, a, it sounded like a month. And I, I went to see the wall, and it's wonderful. There's a, it, you have a great big round um, circle at, at one point, and then there was a big tree you want to move. And the way he handled getting this dry stone wall around it, was he, he showed me some of that. We had sort of this conversation, except I brought up Danbury. He'd driven past the Danbury Fair Mall, and I was like, you've seen the Danbury Fair Mall? You're from, <laughs> where are you from? So it was, it was, but uh, we, he, he had a student dry stone waller on his property, not when I was there, but he had them come in and you know try and build a wall. And we walked all along it, and, and he had a hammer, and he hit, held it by his head. The, the hammer by his head, not me. And, uh, and he took the, the handle of the hammer and he kept going like this. And these little rocks would come flying out. And he said, no, see, now that's no good. They've tried to, to hide this gap. But that's not actually a supporting stone. It can come right out. So he, he was very fussy about how to build a wall. And the walls he's built are, are beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So, um, I can tell you where one is in Mount Kisco, if you ever want to go Yeah, see. I'd actually like to go see his work. I'll, I'll have to write his wife. Uh, she's the one on email and tell her that I yeah, uh, I'm glad you've met him. He's he was a wonderful man, is a wonderful man. I mean, my time with him was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is all the singing a, a cappella or all the instruments? Mm -hmm. Once in a while, someone will play with a fiddle or a harmonica, but it generally is a call and response where the fiddle plays and then they sing, or the harmonica and then they sing. Uh, I don't tend to find a, a accompanied singers in my field, uh, which in most of, well, all of Lena's uh, family were uh, unaccompanied. Uh, at, apparently, her dad used to pick the banjo and play the fiddle, but I, either they broke and they didn't mend them, or they'd gotten rid of them in the house, so uh, they just sang for Dr. Helper. Mm -hmm. Did, were you able to trace any of her songs uh, back to England, or...? Most of the songs that she sang were, uh, there's a thing called a child ballad, which uh, Francis Child had documented the old English ballads and lit, picked 305 of them. Some of them don't even exist anymore. They're like old minstrel songs that probably died out. But a lot of them, like uh, the Prickly Bush and uh, Bo Lakens are versions of, of well-known child ballads. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of her songs uh, that were not uh, local songs uh, were old English ballads, mm -hmm. like uh, Lady Margaret and Fair William were. Yeah, so some of those make sticking pins in the baby pretty tame. <laughs> well, really some of them, well, there's one about uh, blood libel that I won't go into uh, called Sir Hugh, and there are a few uh, that mention um, fratricide, uh, usually as a product of um, uh, a woman being, uh, how can I put this delicately? Well, she's got her brother's child inside her. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so he usually kills her and somehow sails away scot-free because back then the boys could do whatever they wanted. Uh, <laughs> um, so there are a few that are, that are darker maybe than Lampkin, but uh, they're, they're not the ones I really study. Uh, I'm really at this point more interested in local ballads. Um, Lampkin was an exception because it was the first thing I heard from her and it was so strange. Um, but uh, everyone usually dies in a ballad, but it's usually with a broken heart. Uh, I guess if you if you didn't have something big happen, why write a song about it? And the big thing that was happening back then is everyone was dropping dead. <laughs> Does anyone have memory of their grandparents singing or, or even, you know, a last wisp? 
it's, it's unusual that it doesn't really occur in this state, um, but I, I keep, keep seeming to find that, uh, that result. Did you have something to add? Well, I, uh, my father could recite for hours. Um, didn't have much of a singing voice, but uh, he'd go on and on with Robert Service and Kipling and, and the yarn of the ancient mariner, I can remember. We had the, the one bathroom that was warm in the wintertime uh, he'd be in there shaving, he'd be reciting, and I can remember the, the painted ship upon a painted ocean, that line. And then it was his, I grew up in way on in, in Brookhaven, Long Island, mm -hmm. and we had a Pied Piper out there named Bill Bonyan. Have you ever run across this? No, no. I'll tell you all about him sometime. Okay. And he was a great friend of Frank Warner. So a lot of my songs that I learned as a teenager were from Frank and Ann Warner. Jeff just sent me an email the other day. Did he? Yes. Well, on this, the end of this month, we're going to uh, you know, show him. We went 20 years in a row to the uh, Inishon International Folk Song and Ballad Seminar. Mm -hmm. And for two years, it was virtual. And of course, that's not the same thing. Right. And one year, Jeff came over. He was an invited singer one year. And I hadn't seen him in a long time. I knew him as a little kid. Oh. And I told him, told him two stories about his father that he'd never heard. He said, when Lead Belly heard him sing a, so, a song, he said, man, your skin is white, but your soul is black. <laughs> he took it a great time. Very Lead Belly thing to yeah. say, too. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, um, it was um, Frank and Ann Warner did similar work to Herbert Halpert in the American South Collecting, and Jeff and Garrett are uh, sort of in charge of the collection at this point, uh, the two brothers. But that's a wonderful story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the extraordinary thing about it, and Jeff picked this up as well, Frank Warner was the only singer of folk songs that I ever knew who um, they didn't fake the accent or, but I remember one of the first times I ever heard him sing as a teenager, he says, just close your eyes and you listen to Yankee John Belusha sing this song. And um, it was, you know who he was. And, um, and Frank just had this ability to, to recreate somehow this old guy singing. Mm -hmm. And the year that um, Jeff came to in a show, him, he had the same quality. And he, he would play two or three lines from, um, from a field recording and then faded out, and then he finished the song just the way his father did. Mm -hmm. But so many of it, one of the terms or expressions I loathe is the folk revival. Right. <laughs> and yeah. no, it was the commercialization and the cashing in of it. And uh, I remember somebody asked me one time if I knew a song, it was Barbara Allen or something. And I said, of course, so I started singing it. And the look of disappointment, mm -hmm. because it wasn't the way Joan Baez sang it. Uh -huh. Different version. This was you singing it? Huh? This was you? Yeah. What melody do you use? Well, I know, I know four or five of them. <laughs> what was the one you pulled out that, that particular well, moment? Richard Dyer Bennett used to live across the road from me when I was a teenager. And I don't know whether anybody in the room ever heard of Richard Dyer Bennett. Is he somewhere with Lorraine Bennett Hammond? Mm -hmm. Something to do with Lorraine Hammond? Well, he, he was a contemporary of... Um, Burl Lives. Oh, okay. And uh, he was he was he was American, but his his father was uh, British, and uh, Tom, I knew Tom Glazer was a great friend for years, and he, it was said that uh, uh, probably uh, Richard I. Bennett was the only folk singer in Devers Peerage, <laughs> but anyway, he. Um, he lived across the road from me, and he came to Brookhaven because of Bill Bonham, the person I mentioned. And um, I used to hide in the bushes underneath his window. So most, the core of all my child ballads are mostly versions that I learned from uh, Dyer Bennett. And of course, the Barbara Allen classic mm -hmm. one of, in the scarlet town where I was born. That, that there was a family. Hey, well, mm -hmm. Ain't every youth quite well a day. 
and her name was Paula Brianna. But then there's uh, that's a there are probably more versions of Barbara Allen than almost any other. That's right. And I picked a weird one to uh, to sing. It's, I found this one from uh, Boylan Springs, North Carolina. When I go and sing it, um, one day, one day in the month of May, when the flowers were on bloom, and young Johnny Gray from West Tennessee fell in love with Barbara Allen, he sent his. So it was like a cowboy kind of gallop. Uh, I like that better than the sort of yeah. saccharine kind of. Uh, I like things that have a little more cut to them. But yes, there's a million and one ways to do that song. I, I think a wonderful uh, project would be to take um, old child ballads that were, because he only recorded the, the, the words. There were no, um, there were no tunes that a child wrote down. Mm. And uh, Cecil Sharp probably did as much as anybody did. Yeah. Uh, record them later on, but uh, there's a wonderful cowboy song or the Red River Side, and it's the Douglas tragedy. Mm -hmm. And to go from a, a border ballad that there's um, somebody runs off with a young lady, and her all the brothers come chasing after him, and Burl Eyes had recorded a version of it, fa la la la, fa la la la, -la. and. Um, so they get close, and the guy comes out and pulls out his sword and fights off the brothers. And, and uh, then fast forward to Texas. At the foot of Yonder Mountain, there, there lives a fair maiden of Harriet to know. She's pert and she's pretty, she's the girl I adore. One I would marry on the Red River shore. Well, her pond knew our secret and uh, the 20 and 4 came chasing, and anyway, I won't sing the whole thing now, but it's, and uh, it ends with, um, hold your hand, said the old man, let's not fight no more. You can my, marry my daughter on the Red River shore. You can go and have children, at least three or four, and I'll be a grandpa on the Red River shore. <laughs> <laughs> and to take that from the uh, Northern England, and there was a, a lot of border ballads mm -hmm. that go back and forth, mm -hmm. and the DNA that went back and forth mm -hmm. between uh, mm -hmm. Northumberland and Cumberland, and then the Scottish Lowlands. Well, before there was mechanical recording of these songs, they would take them down and, and transcribe them onto sheet music, and sometimes the families that were documented would get a hold of the sheet music, and of course, because it was on a, on a staff, it was cleaned up and sort of better than the, you know, strange quality they might have had. And the family started singing the songs better because they were going off what was written down rather than what they not heard themselves do, you know, because you, you don't have a mirror at that point. Uh, so I always thought that was kind of funny. But um, yeah, I, I would say the radio really changed the way people thought about how a voice could sound. And uh, the high lonesome song of the plains and mountains has sort of gone away uh, to some degree. But uh, but yes, yeah, certainly the, the influence of going from Britain to America and then those people going back to Britain, it's just, it's a wonderful confusion of... Uh, Jeannie Ritchie once said, it wasn't until 1925 that we found out we were hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So, uh, but, uh, you know, what we stress now uh, in the field is collaboration with the informants that we talk to uh, rather than just, you know, looking at them through your your loop or whatever, you know, you really try and uh, get a sense of these people as people, uh, and their stories are so wonderful, why wouldn't you? Uh, I think Helen Flanders definitely failed. She was, she definitely treated Degrini as uh, more as curios, you know, sing it up a little higher here, you know, this is the way, you know, and really trying to put them on the spot and make them into something they, they weren't. Uh, so uh, you can only learn from your forebears and move forward, but it's, uh, it's it's very emotional work for me. It's very heavy in a lot of ways. You know, I've cried a lot doing this work, uh, but it's some of the most rewarding uh, information I've ever gotten in my life. So I'm going to keep doing it. And thank you again to Chris and the Connecticut Crossroads Project. Uh, if anyone has a memory that's not musical and you want to have a conversation with him, he would also like to record you. You don't have to be a singer. Uh, so, uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so before you all leave, uh, there will be an email uh, survey sent out to you. If you could please take it, be, we'd be eternally grateful. So um, just just look out for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.